Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Sipsy, and as always, I have the excellent pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast, that's Matt Schiffman. How are you today, Matt? I'm good, Brian. Feeling a little bi-coastal for this show. Bi-coastal, Matt. I think there's a cream for that. No pun intended, horse racing fans. Hey, we have Big races on both coasts. Maybe that's what Matt means. The Pacific Classic, the Million Dollar Pacific Classic. Matt, we remember when Fast Pal won way back when. They're still going for a million dollars out in San Diego. Part of a great card if you like turf racing. Matt, there's the Del Mar Mile with Mo Forza returning against horses like Smooth Like Straight. You got United in the Del Mar Handicap making another run at that race. And the grade one Del Mar Oaks, lots of three-year-old fillies there. But we're going to start with the Pacific Classic. Then we'll head back Matt's way to the East Coast for the Alabama, the prestigious, historic Alabama, Matt. You ready? Let's go. Let's go. Pacific Classic, $1 million a mile and a quarter, Matt. The favorite on the morning line is Express Train. But I'm going to warn you, sir, that there are six horses between three to one and five to one on this morning line. Did they pick the right horse? as the morning line favorite in express train. I'm not sure, Brian. I mean, I guess if the odds maker is right, then this is kind of a wide open race where he's saying there are four or five horses who have a legitimate shot to win the race. And I guess I sort of agree with that. Yeah, or, or six horses, uh, six horses, five to one or lower. It's, it's, a, it's a unique morning line in this nine horse field. Express train, Matt, is the winner of the local prep, the San Diego, and the son of Union Rags has been very good uh, uh, at Del Mar, especially. He's had two chances on a mile and a quarter, though, Matt. And he came up just a little short in both the Big Cup and the Gold Cup earlier this year. Yeah, that's the feeling I have about Express Train. Of course, uh, uh, trained by uh, fan favorite John Sheriffs. Um, like you said, Brian, he's won three out of four races lifetime at Del Mar. And that certainly... Uh, is important, but in his two tries going that 10 furlongs, uh, he seems to have come up a little short. And, and let's face it, that 10 furlong distance is, is the key to this race. Yeah, I think it is the key to this race, but I think Del Mar is a big part of the equation as well, Matt, because some horses like Del Mar better, and it looks like he does better at Del Mar than maybe Santa Anita, although he did run some good races at Santa Anita. The big cap Looked like he might be a winner about 100 yards from the wire before Idle reeled him in late in that mile and a quarter big cap. So certainly Express Train has come close at the mile and a quarter distance off the win in the San Diego. I think they do have the right morning line favorite. But as it, as it sounds right now, neither Matt and I are convinced that the favorite is going to win this Pacific Classic. Next on the morning line is Royal Ship. Royal Ship was the favorite in the San Diego. And before the race, we thought Express Train had a chance to beat him in that race beat the favorite royal ship because of the drop down in distance now we're going back up to a mile and a quarter maybe royal ship is better off the brazilian bread at a mile and a quarter could be on that one brian he uh, of course was second in that hollywood gold cup uh, earlier in the year he was third in the san diego uh which i guess was a little bit disappointing and uh does not have any wins at del mar no wins at Del Mar. He, in fact, he only has one win in America after being a real uh, tiger down in Brazil. But on the other hand, he's run good races, especially of late. He won the uh, Californian over Country Grammar in a game performance at nine furlongs. Country Grammar got the best of him late in that 10 furlong Hollywood Gold Cup. And then he was kind of stuck down on the rail and never really fired big, although he wasn't beaten by much in the San Diego Third choice, morning line, four to one, Matt. Dr. Post eats, meets West here because we have a pretty good horse coming from the East for trainer Todd Fletcher coming off a win on the Jersey Shore. Yeah, and I think both, I remember, Brian, both you and I were very impressed with that victory uh, at Monmouth Park. I think we both looked at it as maybe a coming of age for Dr. Post is now this older and more mature Dr. Post ready to, to live up to some of his hype that was around him uh, as a three-year-old. We'll see going across country is never easy. Um, he gets Joe Al Rosario uh, uh, on him at Del Mar. 
Yeah, I think Joel Rosario is important. Uh, one of the reasons I think so, Matt, is because this horse has never been a mile and a quarter before. He was second in the Belmont Stakes last year, of course, but that was when it was a nine furlong Belmont Stakes. I thought that was one of his best races, certainly his best effort in a grade one race. So this year he's won two out of three, but both came in grade three races. I did think the Monmouth Cup, though, was a very good performance. And if you look at that uh, past performance for the Monmouth Cup, it was his first race with blinkers. I, I think that is also important. Uh, li listen, both Matt and I, I think Matt even more than me, are, are not quite sure how these older horses in California stack up against some of the Eastern horses, horses who ran in the Whitney like Nick's go and Maxfield, for instance. Hey, I'm not even sure if Dr. Post stacks up with horses like uh, Maxfield and Nick's go. But uh, if, in fact, these coast horses are better, Dr. Post, this looks like a really good spot. Rosario is one of my favorite jockeys to get a horse that can for a long trip. So I think Dr. Post with blinkers now for the second start coming off a big run certainly is one of the horses to beat in my eyes in this Pacific Classic. Then we got three horses, Matt, count them, three more horses, all at five to one. Uh, let's start with Tripoli, who has only had two career dirt races, but you have to like what you've seen since he switched to the dirt. Yeah, that's for sure. That was a, certainly an interesting move from John Sadler after all of those uh, turf races to go back to the dirt, but he did it, and the last two uh, have been very nice second in the San Diego handicap prepping for this race um, makes him a viable candidate. I don't know. He was another one where maybe I had a question about the distance. Yeah. And I'm not going to agree with you on that, Matt, just because I'm looking at that pedigree. He's had a lot of races, mostly on the turf where he's been involved. I worry about him wanting to get to the winner's circle or getting to the wire first might be one of those horses that doesn't necessarily have a nose for the wire but as for the mile and a quarter I really like the stretch out for him because he's got uh distance breeding on both sides and if you look at his two dirt races one was an allowance but he was game in victory and they were way ahead of the third horse it was a nice allowance score his first dirt race of his life and then last time if you look closely at that San Diego it was only a mile 16th but he was the one that was really running best at the end in fact, it looked like he was going to get to express train pretty quick after the wire. Tripoli, this will be a big test as he moves up to grade one company, but uh, he ran against big boys in the San Diego and he looked awfully good to me. Sadler and Ronis Racing. Ronis Racing have had great luck in big races at Del Mar, including the Pacific Classic. Another five to one shot map that interests me a little bit is Tiz a Magician. Tiz a Magician is kind of a slowly developing, he's a consistent horse, but a slowly developing son of Tiz now clearly one of the best horses in America on dirt at 12 furlongs. I wonder about 10 furlongs because 10 furlongs he's racing against tougher company. Yeah. And there, you know, obviously you can look at it and say, whoa, he just won the, the Cougar handicap uh, going a mile and a half. So the, the 10 furlong distance shouldn't be a factor. Well, well, technically uh, that's true, but those kind of races are run very differently. Um, and in those longer races, um, Tis a Magician has been able to press the pace, but again, that's going a mile and a half as opposed to 10 furlongs. All that being said, it sounds like I'm down on that on this horse, but actually I find him, find him interesting. And as you said before, Brian, he looks like a horse that uh, um, may be coming around for trainer Richard Mandela and he's shown that he likes Del Mar also. Yeah, he, he has a couple wins at Del Mar. He has a, uh, a, an experienced record at Del Mar, actually. It's, it's not like he moves up at Del Mar, but certainly Del Mar's a track he can win at, as evidenced by that Cougar win last time. Uh, I, I also noticed, I, I mentioned uh, Ronis Racing and uh, John Sadler. Uh, you got to talk about Flavian Pratt if you're talking about any stick trace out in, uh, in Del Mar. And Flavian Pratt is the aunt is a magician. You're right. You made a really good point, though, about the pace, because I think this horse is best when he's running long and when he's on the lead. He can pass horses, but I think it's a little tougher when the pace is a little bit tougher. Not that there's a lot of speed in here, but uh, it'll be a little bit stronger pace than he's used to in those 12 furlongs. Uh, races for sure. Last five to one shot on the field, Matt, is Independence Hall. This horse has been an enigma 
He does just enough to think, well, maybe he can really win something big. And, and I think we're still at that point, as evidenced by the five to one morning line in this million dollar race. But he's had a layoff and you can't really like what you saw in the last race. Maybe Michael McCarthy has turned him around in those months since he's been off. Talented horse, but I just don't know. Yeah, for sure, Brian. All the way back to when he was racing on the East Coast and uh, on the Triple Crown Trail, the, the, those same things uh, kept coming up. Wow, that that last race was really good. This horse has got some talent, and then he never seems to quite live up to it. Um, out of all the horses that we've mentioned that are clustered around three to one, four to one, five to one, he's the one that I think will probably be uh, higher than that. He does have a win in his one start at Del Mar, but for me. He's had enough chances. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a lot of respect for Michael McCarthy, and I think it's possible that he pops up and runs a big race. His mile and a quarter race in grade one company earlier this year wasn't bad, but the layoff and everything in the five to one morning line, I just, I, I can't trust Independence Hall in here. Uh, the others, Matt, Cu uh, Cupid's Claws ran a good race, a uh, 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 mile and a half, beating Tis a Magician last year. Hasn't won since. Magic on Top is also a graded stakes winner. His came sprinting. Sheriff Brown is the son of Curlin, who did well in Texas, but I don't know if any of them have a real big shot. Maybe Cupid's Claws would be the one that least surprised me if a long shot ran on Saturday. Yeah, because they put the blinkers back on Cupid's Claw for that last race, and it seemed to have made a difference. Yeah, and, and he is rounding into form, maybe. He was a decent second behind Tis a Magician last time in the race we talked about at Del Mar, the Cougar. All right, that's our preview for the Pacific Classic. I, uh, I look forward to seeing this race mount a little bit because, hey, the Breeders' Cup Classic is a mile and a quarter at Del Mar in just a few months. So if somebody runs well here, if somebody runs big here, or even if we have a few horses that run good races, to be first, second, or third. These are horses that we should see in the Breeders' Cup Classic. And I still think there are a few questions with horses like Nick's Go and Maxfield. So these horses are probably horses that we could talk about in the Breeders' Cup Classic in a few months. Yeah, no doubt. It's, uh, it's the home field for the Breeders' Cup and Pacific Classic has always been important uh, prep race for, for the big one uh, in November especially when the Breeders' Cup is at Del Mar, as it is this year. But we're going to leave the, uh, the beautiful track there on the ocean north of San Diego for now, Matt, because we head to upstate New York, Saratoga, the best race meet in all of America. Yes, I'm slightly biased, but I'm going to say it. it's the best race meet in all of America, Matt. You're shaking your head. Yes, I think that means you agree with me. And I think we have a very interesting edition of this historic Alabama. 600,000 also a mile and a quarter on the main track, Matt. We have to start with Malathot, even though she was beaten for the first time last time. I see her as a heavy favorite again, one uh, uh, here in the Alabama. Yeah, I think she will absolutely be the the favorite and and a well bet favorite in this race. Um, the race is featuring the the third matchup between Malathot and Maracucha. The third matchup. This is the rubber match. Yeah, Maracucha. Maracucha got her last time in the Coaching Club American Oaks. That reminds me, Matt, if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here on Horse Racing Nation, please do so now. My producer is yelling at me to get this out. He wants you to turn on your notifications so you never miss another episode. Maracucha did beat Malathot last time, Matt. Malathot, that's her first career loss. She was 5-5, five to 3-10 five, to ten favorite in that grade one Coaching Club American Oaks. I think she's an Eclipse Award winner with one more good win, including Saturday. If she wins the Alabama, I think she's pretty much wrapped up the three-year-old Philly division. But I, I'm not so sure this is going to be easy either, just as the Coaching Club American Oaks proved uh, not to be. She was on the lead, though, in the Coaching Club American Oaks, Matt. And I think that's a point we need to make because she doesn't really want to be on the lead. I guess she won one race previously on the lead, but that was when she was just head and shoulders above the field in talent. So in this race, I think she can stalk, which is probably a preferable running style for the beautifully bred daughter of Curlin. Yeah, I, I agree. It will not be an easy of Alabama to win for Malathot, but as you were alluding to, it's going to be a different race 
than the coaching club American Oaks certainly was. They they really didn't have much chance breaking from the rail uh, last time to accept to go for the lead. And, and Clarier hounded uh, uh, Malathot all the way around the track and, uh, uh, you know, had to work, never got a chance to, to relax or take a little breather. Um, and Maracuja was the one that benefited from that, sitting right behind it, making the final move and, and just getting up at the wire as Malathot really dug in after all of that uh, pressure and barely lost. We're going 10 furlongs here. None of them have ever gone 10 furlongs. They may not go 10 furlongs again until they get to be older horses if they do it even then. But certainly, and Todd Pletcher has talked about this all along with Malathot, the longer the race, the better. Yeah, it would seem so. Malathot uh, looks like a horse who can handle a distance and she finishes her races really well. And yes, I'm even saying that about the coaching club American Oaks where she was beaten late. She finished that race really well after what Matt described happened uh, throughout the race. So obviously the horse to beat, I think she is... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, 0 for 1 at Saratoga, but uh, if you're going to lose, I'll, I'll say the same thing about domestic spending last week in uh, Arlington. Uh, they lost in, in the right way. I, I didn't think domestic spending lost a whole lot in my eyes when he couldn't quite get there on a really bad pace in the Mr. D last week. I don't think Malathot lost a lot in my eyes from that coaching club American Oaks, but at Saratoga, she'll be a heavy favorite again, and I think there's a lot of good fillies in here who have a shot I'm going to start with Maracuja, Matt, who I don't think, and maybe your words uh, uh, kind of describe what I'm talking about. I don't think she gets enough respect for how well she ran in the coaching club of American Oaks. I did not check all the speed figures of three-year-old fillies this year, but it has to be one of the top performances run by any three-year-old filly. I mean, they ran a really good race in that coaching club of American Oaks. She was closer to the pace than she's used to. Yeah, I think it did work out well for her, the race set up, the way she sat in third and then was able to power home. But on the other hand, I thought it was a really big performance. Her only race where she was out of the money was the Kentucky Oaks, where she was down on the inside and kind of in traffic a lot of the way, past tired horses to finish in the mid-pack. But I like her race before that in the Gazelle. I like her maiden breaking win. I mean, there's really not a lot to like. And maybe the thing I like best, getting Ricardo Santana Jr. again for the second time, is she's one for one at Saratoga. And I think that's pretty important. Yeah, Brian, it's, you know, like you were uh, saying, it isn't just the victory in the uh, uh, Coaching Club American Oaks. And that that big top, that big speed figure, certainly uh, Malathot earned the same thing. And certainly that a big speed figure really is more due to the pace that Malathot set in there um, than what uh, than what Maracuja did in terms of uh, 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 setting up that speed figure. But yeah, the seventh in the Kentucky Oaks was dis was certainly disappointing on the heels of that second in the Gazelle, which was in a, which was against a very good field. So it was more as if in the coaching club American Oaks that Maracuja lived up to a little bit of the promise that she flashed in the gazelle. However, I am one that is willing to say Maracuja got everything her way in the CCA Oaks as opposed to Malathot, who did not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the other hand, Matt, I'll counter with uh I think Malathot might be even money or so this time and Maracuja still might be five to one or something. So there's, there's reason to think, well, why couldn't Maracuja do it again? And 10 furlongs probably will suit her the way she's running down the stretch. I really like the gazelle where search results, uh, it was just no pace at all. And Maracuja still rallied well to be second there. So this is a Philly I've been watching this year and the coaching club of American Oaks. I wish I I wish I better at 14 to one, but I think there's still a chance for value in the Alabama. Crazy Beautiful might be the second choice. I listed her as a slight second choice over Maracuja on the morning line. Crazy Beautiful's won three graded stakes nicely around the country in, in her last four starts. Matt, what's not to like about Crazy Beautiful? Um, well, I what's not to like is that this um, Alabama is certainly, even after those 
last two graded stakes wins in the Delaware Oaks, a grade three, and the Summertime Oaks, a grade two. This is going to be a class challenge. This is going to be a test for Crazy Beautiful when, uh, when we find out, well, just how good is Crazy Beautiful uh, in this field. But again, uh, um, you, you have her at seven to two. I don't know, Brian. The, the New York betters are pretty savvy. I'm not sure if she's going to be the second choice over Maracuja, but it certainly will be very close. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how she's bet because that Delaware Oaks on paper and then out in California in the summertime Oaks before that and the Gulfstream Park Oaks four races go all look pretty good. I will warn you on two things with this good looking great daughter of Liam's map though. Mile and a quarter, I'm not sure if she wants a mile and a quarter as much as some of the others. Maybe counter that with how well Kenny McPeak has done in a mile and a quarter big races over the years at Saratoga. And another thing I want to say is I'm not sure who she beat. Maybe the best filly she beat is Suse uh, it, it, out in California, who I think is a nice filly. But really, this, this is a jump up in class when we're talking about Malapat Maracuja and others. Uh, Crazy Beautiful did not run at all in the Kentucky Oaks, but on the other hand, she really lost a lot at the start. She doesn't have a lot of speed, though. I don't know what to think. Uh, as the, as the co-second choice or so, I am looking elsewhere on a filly that I do like a lot. Another one we have to mention for sure, Matt, and, and we may be similar form to Crazy Beautiful is Army Wife. She's coming off two impressive graded stakes scores. Yes, absolutely, Brian. Uh, a, a big win, kind of her coming out party in the Black Eyed Susan um, with a very nice rally to, to win that race against the good field, which she followed up um, with a win in the Iowa Oaks. Certainly that field not as, uh, as tough as the one in the Black Eyed Susan. Um, and that race was in the beginning of July and uh, trainer Mike Maker has uh, been prepping her for this Alabama. Um, Mike Maker right now is the leading trainer at Saratoga and he has been making all of the right moves, the right decisions with his horses this summer. Yeah, although last Saturday in the grade one field pass uh, did, did not do much for trainer Mike Maker, but I'm with you. Mike Maker's having a great Saratoga. Army wife, uh, I can say a lot of the same things about Crazy Beautiful. She's, she doesn't have a lot of speed, uh, but I really like her dirt form. Since she switched to dirt, she's been really good. And I just have a feeling that she might be even more than Crazy Beautiful moving forward to a strong race. And I think you kind of alluded to that uh, with a little bit of break and training at Saratoga. Um, yeah, Mike Maker's going well. Army wife. Again, I, I don't really know who she beat in, in those win. She was third behind Maracuja and search results, of course, in the Gazelle, but she didn't have a great trip. I, I think you could almost draw a line through that. She's been uh, really good in her last two starts, a very interesting horse. I have her at six to one, which sounds pretty attractive for a nice developing daughter of Declaration of War. I can't throw out Clarier, Matt, but she just hasn't been able to get there against top competition lately. Hasn't been able to get there in terms of finding the winner's circle, Brian, but hitting the board and getting big checks in, in the big races has continued to be the MO for Clarier. And, and hey, let's give her credit for that third place finish in the Coaching Club American Oaks. Um, the, the connection, Steve Asmussen uh, figured that the only chance she got, she had was to press the pace against Malathot. And, and, and that was a pretty tough task. Third in the CCA Oaks, third in the Mother Goose, hitting the board all the time. Um, she doesn't run a bad race. She doesn't run a bad race, but she hasn't won since her first start this year. And Malathot sure looked better than her in both the Kentucky Oaks and the Coaching Club American Oaks. Yeah, Clarier has been close to the pace before. Maybe she likes to come a little bit farther off at the Malathot. So the fact that Malathot really did put her away pretty quickly when they came for home in the mile and eighth coaching club American Oaks just doesn't give me a lot of confidence. She'll have better odds than she's ever had, probably even higher than she was in the Kentucky Oaks. But uh, I, I don't know. I just like others better. Played hard. Interesting. Uh, she looked decent sprinting in maiden races, fast maiden races. And then when she stretched out for the last two, she won both for fun on the lead. She looks to set the pace in the Alabama. 
Yeah, nice allowance win. And Kentucky trainer Phil Bauer is having a pretty good Saratoga meeting. But boy, that's a tough ask. It's a tough ask unless they leave her completely alone and she's she is as good as she looks like she might be because both the win at Churchill Downs and Saratoga were, were quite impressive. She's a daughter of Into Mischief. Um, you always got to fear the horse on the lead a little bit, but I kind of agree with you, Matt, in that this is a big jump up in class because this is a strong edition of the Alabama. The last horse on the list, Matt, we've gone through the entire field now is Will Secret. I tell you what, she was kind of one of the long shots I threw in in my exotics in the Kentucky Oaks. And despite a very bad performance in the Indiana Oaks, that's her only bad performance uh, that I see in a long time. And Will Take Charge did awfully well at 10 furlongs at Saratoga. If you're looking for a bomb to throw in underneath in your superfecta trifecta, draw a line through that Indiana Oaks perhaps and throw this filly in. Yeah, you're going to have to draw a line through that sixth place performance. But if you do that, then you've got third place finishes in the Kentucky Oak and the Ashland in big uh, in big races. Um, and yeah, this horse is going to be the long shot. Yeah, probably too many good horses to really get excited about her chances. But hey, at 20 to one or something, uh, third or fourth could could pay nicely in those exotics. So you never know with Will Secret, a two time stakes winner. As Matt said, she was third. She beat Clarier. She was third in the Kentucky Oaks, just two starts back. All right, Matt, we also got the Lake Placid on turf at Saratoga on Saturday. So there's a lot of turf racing, even though Matt and I chose to focus on these big mile and a quarter dirt races. I think there's a Breeders' Cup Classic implications. I think there's Eclipse Award implications in these two races. So I'm pretty excited to see them, Matt. Can I get a parting shot from you, my friend? Yeah, how about we do our pick, our, our race picks, Brian, before we do our parting shots? That is a wonderful idea, Matt. Let's do that. Have we not said who we like yet? What am I well, thinking? We didn't. We've been putting that off till the end. You want uh, you want to start us off, Brian? Okay, I can do that. Uh, I'm tempted. I'm really tempted to make Dr. Post, the Eastern Invader, my top pick in the Pacific Classic. I just have a feeling his odds are going to be a little lower than I want. And I'm not sold on 10 furlongs. I like the blinkers. I like Rosario. I like the move out west to see what he can do against these California horses. But my tepid, very tepid top pick is going to be Tripoli. I just think he's a dirt horse who's going to like 10 furlongs. I love the way he finished in San Diego. I'm going to go Tripoli over Dr. Post. Hopefully their third or fourth choice, no better than that. I kind of felt the same way, Brian, when I was trying to make my choices. I really wanted to make Dr. Post my top choice, but, you know, that uh, Monmouth Cup looked really good, but it's just one race. So uh, I'm putting Dr. Post as my second choice. And on top, I'm going to go out, go with one of the California horses. I'm going to go with Mandela and Tis a Magician on top. Oh, when you said Mandela, I thought you might be on the royal ship. But Tism is different. Yeah, he's got tactical speed and he's got Flavian Pratt. So probably have better odds than Tripoli, I would think, although they're both five to one on the morning line. So neither Matt and I are on the two morning line favorites. That's a good thing. We both have Dr. Post number two. How about you start out the Alabama? I'm thinking about even money on Malafat. Do we try to beat her in here? Well, Brian, I am going to try to beat Malathot and Maracuja in here because uh, I think that that race was quite a battle. And, and there, are, there are those who would say that after a knockdown drag out at a kind of result in the Coaching Club American Oaks, those two are going to be hard pressed to repeat that performance. Frankly, Brian, I really believe that Malathot is the horse to beat, especially going 10 furlongs. But hey, come on, Brian, you had to know that I was going to make Army Wife my top choice. And my second choice is going to be Malathot. Yeah, Army Wife. Matt, Matt tapped her as a long shot in the Black Eyed Susan. I liked her in the Iowa Oaks. Now Matt likes her here. Maybe one of us will be right for the third straight time in a uh, horse center previewed race. Army wife should be no better than the fourth choice in here, Matt. So I like it. I am also going to try to beat Malathot and Crazy Beautiful, but I'm going to use Merrick Kuja because I just have seen so many horses over the years come to Saratoga, really like Saratoga. 
and kind of have coming out parties. And they not only do it the first time, they do it the second time as well. I'm thinking Jim Dandy and uh, Travers winners. And I'm thinking of uh, either test winners. Uh, I guess it's more test winners going to Alabama over the years. But uh, Coaching Club American Oaks used to be at Belmont. But I digress. I'm going Maracuja. I think she could do it again. I love the way Ricardo Santana Jr. rode her in his first trip aboard the Daughter of Honor Code in the Alabama. I don't think she's going to be real low in the year. I'm thinking four to one is about as low as she gets with the specter of Malathot. You're right, though. Malathot is strictly the one to beat. I do like Army White third best, Matt, but I'm going Maracuja over Malathot. Now it's time for your party shot. There we go, Brian. Um, and I think we got some nice uh, odds and some nice picks there. It's raining, raining, raining up at Saratoga. I don't think there's going to be any turf racing. Uh, they, they're already off the turf today. I doubt there'll be turf racing on Friday. Who knows about Saturday? Either way, they'll be running the Alabama on the dirt and enjoy that race and the Pacific Classic. And, if I, and of course, I want to thank our producer, Tony Badabing, for putting together the show. Hey, thanks to Bingo, our producer. Thanks to Candace Curtis for the race uh, graphics. Thanks to our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. And thanks to you fans all for watching. We appreciate it. We'll be back next week here on Horse Center talking Travers. Matt, we get to talk to Travers next week, which is good news indeed. We'll see you right here next week on Horse Center.